Hey everyone, it has been like a year, a full year since we have done a true episode of Annex School Live. Sorry about the wait, things got a little crazy at Annex Den, but today I'm really excited about this guest. I don't know, maybe four years ago, it's been a long time. I was sitting in Michelle Monnier and Sam Malawi's lab in Beverly Hills, listening to this doctor, Matt Najad, speak a little bit about what led him to practice the kind of dentistry he practices, very high-end biomimetic aesthetic dentistry. He was preaching the gospel that I believe in about how we should follow nature. It should look natural and be in harmony with the patient's face, be in harmony with the patient's age. So as I'm sitting here listening to him and listening to his story and how he arrived at practicing this kind of dentistry, I was blown away and immediately went up to him at the next break and said, can you just say all that again and let me film you because people need to hear your story. So this next interview started, my, my guest, um, I invited him on the show because I wanted him to tell that story. And then a couple nights ago, before we do this, this is kind of an interesting way that we do these live broadcasts. There's a different kind of um, application we use, a little web app we use. And so I always like to introduce my guests to it before we go live so they know what to expect. And in that discussion, I uncovered another part of his story, a more recent chapter in his story that I realized was just as important to tell you guys. So what started out being an interview I had planned to discuss his origin story, if you will, ended up being a discussion where we're gonna talk about that and then transition into what it's been like for him, why he brought a master ceramist on board on his team to be his in-house technician, what that process has been like and how they've gotten to where they are as a team, the practicing dentistry at a level that he um, is so happy with now. So without further ado, I bring you episode eight of Annex School. Hey, Dr. Nishant. Hey, Jay. How you doing? Good. Very good. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to talk to us and to tell us a little bit about your story and um, help us understand a little bit about your perspective on what it's like to have an in-house technician and start working as a team together in your practice. Um, so just to tell people a little bit about you, you've been in private practice since 2010 in Beverly Hills. That's right. No pressure. Like, you know, Beverly Hills aesthetic dentistry, no pressure at all with your patients, nope. I'm sure. Well, actually, so no pressure now. Well, there's there's difficult patients, but I've been in Beverly Hills since 2013. I opened my first office in Simi Valley. Kind of the way I think about it is somewhere where I could practice at a lower overhead and have the opportunity to learn at a slower pace. And then I kind of migrated or graduated to like the big leagues. I always say it's like, you know, I started yeah. with amateur <laughs> ball and worked my way up, felt comfortable. And, you know, when I felt ready, I made the step into the steeper competition in this area. So 2013 Beverly Hills, up until then, it was in Simi Valley, a smaller, smaller town, blue collar uh, patient base and very nice patient base. And I did the same type of dentistry. I was just still learning at the time. Yeah. Yeah. OK, that makes sense. So back when you first set out with your practice, you graduated from USC. And then after graduation, you entered Pascal Monnier's program. Is that correct? Almost. It was during it was so the Pascal Monnier's program that I did. It was called the Aesthetic Selective. And it was a program in your last two years of dental school. The first year, it was once a week lectures for about, I think it was like 24 weeks, if I'm not mistaken. So once a week, we'd come three hours, we had to clear our schedule and manage all the other obligations so that we had the free time carved out. Mm -hmm. Then, then from there, there was like 30 or 40 students. Then from there, the top 13 students were able to go on for another year of clinical once a week with Pascal Manier. So a smaller 
um, a, a better ratio of faculty to students. You would pair up with an, one of the other students as your assistant. And basically you got to work with him doing cases under his supervision and guidance and mentorship. Wow. So two full years essentially, but all of it in your last two years concurrent with dental school. Got it, got it. So when you applied for dental school, when you began dental school, what were, I remember when you spoke at that course at Michelle's lab, yeah. what did dentistry look like to you? What was your dream practice? What did you think life would be like? Yeah, so I actually have contact with somebody that, you know, we talk about this exact thing, but I, I shadowed for a dentist and before dental school, she's actually my patient now, which is the craziest thing. So, <laughs> um, and I remember looking at those magazines, like I forget what they're called, but basically like the ideal practice showing you like the beautiful lobby reception area, 10 chairs, but basically uh, a practice that is a highly profitable business. I didn't really think so much necessarily about quality precision. I, you know, I assumed I'm going to do good work, but not that wasn't my emphasis to be the best at anything. It was to own a business where I can combine you know, using my hands and making things and fixing things and being an entrepreneur, because I've always been kind of entre the I've had the entrepreneurial spirit uh, and I've yeah, always wanted yeah, to do yeah. that. So that's what it that's what it was. Essentially, I, I thought maybe I would own like four or five practices eventually be a business owner and supervise and really kind of grow like a chain of practices. OK, so going into your last two years, you had to kind of be handpicked, right? You had to really meet a certain criteria to be accepted into Pascal Monnier's program. So I remember you talking about how you worked, you had, you had to go the extra mile to get there. So what was it about that program that you knew or thought you knew about it that made it something that was so important to you? Yeah, absolutely. So once I got into dental school, I, I had always had really good grades, were, really worked hard to get into dental school, top of my class, um, and really like strive to be the best in my academics. But when I got into dental school, I felt like I had reached the, uh, the final straw where like, you know, I could relax now. I could, you know, like I'm going to be a dentist, everything will be fine. So I didn't work that hard first couple of years. I really did the minimum. <laughs> In fact, with personal issues with girlfriend and so on at the time, I actually even remediated a couple classes, like fundamental classes, like amalgam. Uh, I literally had to retake and remediate, <laughs> you know. And so at one point, right around that remedial process, I remember Pascal spoke about whitening. He did a lecture and I just felt his passion. He showed cases like blowing, blowing my mind, like how like- And you do see his look. passion comes through when he's on stage. I, I know what 100%. you're talking about. It, it, it's infectious. And you see him speak and I'm in remedial. And then I think he mentioned in that lecture or, or there was a buzz. It was either he mentioned it or an email came shortly after that like, you know, for those of you who clear your schedule and you're in, you have to have like top 10% in the composite class. You know what I mean? Okay, you have to be, okay. I wasn't, I was in remedial of amalgam <laughs> and not top 10%. Whoops. So I just, something clicked. I'm like, what am I doing? Like, I need to be, I, I, it's not in me to do what I'm doing. Like I need to turn this around, like get my life together and, you know, strive to be the best, the best I can be, you know, at least mm -hmm. the best I can be, you know, I'm, I'm not the best I can be, whether I'm the best in the world or anything, that doesn't matter, but I'm not trying my best. And this is my profession. I'm going to do this. So I turned things around. I got out of remedial. I started clearing my schedule. I had to talk to academic affairs and say, can I please just attend his lectures? Because oh, wow. I wasn't qualified to actually be in the program, but the in Pascal literally said, no, no, like it's only for the top 10%. I can't allow this, but I had people batting for me. Like I could, Academic affairs is like you cleared your whole schedule. Nobody else did that. You had to do certain things. They like be you able had to, to make a big move to show move. them that you were serious. So she basically people begged for me and they said, fine, he can come to the lectures, but he cannot like graduate to the next part. He can just, you know, sit and it's like, what, what does it matter? Someone could watch the lectures. Why not? You know, and then I did the best in that program, best presentation, highest grade on the test. And he literally we talk about it to this day. He's like, I had no choice. He's like, you know, here you are like working harder than everyone else to get into the program. You didn't fit the description of what the requirements at the time, but you cleared your schedule. You went to every session. You got the highest grade on the test and you had the best presentation he's like 
I had to. And he's a very spiritual and religious person. He said he felt like it was meant to be. Meant to so be. that's how that's I did so it. And cool. and I secretly hoped for that the whole time. You know, like that was, I said, I'm going to show that I want to be in this program. And I think there's a lot of valuable lessons that came for myself and for others when you like, you know, when you commit 100% to something, sometimes yeah. you can, you know, change the trajectory big time. Well, and that seems to be kind of a theme. It's funny because when you and I met up to do kind of the prep for this live stream, yeah. um, I really didn't, it hadn't clicked in my mind yet how much you had continued to push in your practice once you went out into the world as a clinician and you've been out practicing now first in Simi Valley, then you get to the big leagues in Beverly Hills. Yeah. And it clicked with me when we were talking. Oh, wow. You never stopped. You kept pushing. So one of the things that um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, once you studied with Pascal, biomimetics became so important. The excellence in the restorative work you were doing, in the restorations you were seeding, all of that became so important to constantly be improving. You're not an easy client for a lab. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I can imagine I yeah. you're not an easy client for a lab. No, no, no. <laughs> Definitely not. value what a good lab can do, which is Absolutely. one of the main reasons that I was first even interested in, in talking with you about this topic, because you have to understand a lot of the technicians that I talk to on a daily basis and extent doesn't really target labs that are just kind of doing the status quo, just kind of out there doing a job. Right. We really are here to add value for technicians who want to do their best. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I want to talk about before we talk about bringing a technician in-house, there were a lot of years you were practicing where you didn't have that set up. Yeah. So when that was the case, how did you, what kind of criteria did you use when you were looking for a technician or looking for a lab to work with? Yeah. So I want to bridge to this, like essentially like in dental school, having experienced that I knew I wanted to practice this way. So first thing I realized is I have to open my own practice. I, I wanted to have an opportunity to work with somebody like minded, but I couldn't find it. And instead of, instead of saying things like, Oh, you, you know, like I thought like, you know, I wasn't fortunate enough. And I thought that like, if I'm lucky, I'll find something, but instead I created my own opportunity. I said, let's just do this. I'm going to prepare. Yeah. And our school was based on problem-based learning where you basically have to research yourself. There wasn't formal classrooms except for lab stuff. It was all based on here's a case study, research it, learn, learn the different objectives. So I looked at my practice the same way. I said, how am I going to start a practice? I'm going to read about insurance, about hiring, about staffing. I'm going to look at a bunch of practices. And then when I started practicing that transition to the lab, I'm like, shoot, I don't know a good lab. Let me ask around, got some info, couldn't find anybody in my region or in my price range. So I started with a local lab and I'm like, well, hey, if you want to be good at something, you got to also do it yourself. So I did a little bit of it myself in composite. And I also did a lot of the wax ups. Like if I asked for the wax ups every time on a case before proceeding. So I started working on it and I wasn't great. I just wanted to learn. And I, I did want to change things based on what had come back, you know, in the first couple. So I, what I searched for is someone that's willing to do that. You know what I mean? Like I had to be able to find a partner lab that was at least receptive to that. If you're not willing to work with me on that, it wouldn't be a good fit. Found somebody, we worked together. Um, it definitely made a difference in doing that. But I think the most important thing is someone that has either a sim similar vision or at least a willingness to accommodate the workflow that I had in mind and the, uh, end result that I had in mind as well. Yeah, you know, it's funny that you say that because a lot of the technicians I speak to would tell me exactly the same thing, just the flip perspective of that. And I, I think when I look at the clinician technician duos that I really admire and I respect a lot, it's two people who know themselves well enough or self-aware enough <laughs> to yeah. say, this is how I work. How do yeah. you work? I think a lot of technicians might not really have an honest grasp about what they need and clinicians the same. So to me, it seems like you really knew what you wanted. You knew how you needed to work together with the technician. And when you found somebody who could um, support that and be behind that and share that vision, that would work. So did you work with different technicians or different labs for different types of cases or restorations, or were you really sticking with like one partner? 
I experimented with a few that only got like one restoration done because it just wasn't, you know. It wasn't in sync. It wasn't in sync. Um, three, I remember three sticking. One of them was the first one. We did probably 10 cases together. He was the closest to my practice and I would do a lot of the wax ups. But the problem I saw was even though he was willing to let me modify and change the wax up, there wasn't, it didn't seem like there was the same vision, like, okay, fine, whatever you want. It was, we weren't growing together. Like mm -hmm. as we were going, I wasn't seeing progress. Then a friend introduced me to another lab that he had been using, who's now retired, but I worked with them a lot on every posterior restoration. They shared the vision like mm -hmm. fully. They would make restorations without me asking. I didn't know this. They would make two or three restorations sometimes to <laughs> find the right shade. I didn't know this. I would get back restorations often like, man, this is really wow. how I want it. And I'd give them feedback and share photographs. But it's like, they're like, we made three times. I didn't know that. I didn't ask for three, but they, they would hold a certain caliber just based on that. So they stuck for a long time. I had an anterior person I worked with a lot. Um, out in Kentucky, I believe. And he was just uh, really talented at doing the bigger cases. So I'd work with him for those, but turnaround time wasn't achievable. And I think his, even his emphasis wasn't on one restoration. He wanted to focus on six, 10, 12 or yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So you, over the course of a few years had different ebbs and flows, probably in your relationship with the technicians and the labs you were working with. Um, yeah. Now you have an in-house master ceramist that you work with every day. So yeah. what, what led to that decision? As you work, so ultimately, even the other people I worked with on the bigger cases. So my, my, as, I, as I practiced, I realized what I really want to do a lot of is uh, the highest quality, but also focusing on bigger cases, you know, and there's so many details, like anyone that does these knows that you can make it simple, but you're cutting some corners. If you want to have the best planning, the best design, the best wax up, the best communication, there's a lot of steps involved. You know, you can call uh, you can f figure out the minimum, you can go over the top, but there's a place where you're both on the same page, you understand. And I just realized that for me to get to the place I want to be and to, you know, keep improving the aesthetics and the function and even like the occlusion that I needed to be really working with one person. And what was happening time and time again, there was a few other labs I worked with for anterior cases during this transition period. But what would happen is, they'd either be busy, the turnaround would be three or four weeks. That's not realistic for the type of work I do. I don't need it to be one week, but I can't have people in temporaries for three or four weeks. It's just not, it's, it's, it's creates Your problems. Your clientele like, doesn't accept it. And, and I think it creates problems. Like, I mean, it's not like it's, it's impossible to do, but the temporary is probably going to have an issue over a four week period versus a two week okay. period. So yeah. there was that there was, they would be, so they'd be busy sometimes and sometimes they wouldn't, but like, you know, when they're busy, I had no control over it. There was, mm -hmm. I would get cases back, you know, a couple of days before, but it wasn't fast enough where I could still change, you know, like we couldn't send it back and forth enough times so that like the, the result was predictable enough to how I needed to be. And then finally, uh, with all that said, there was consistency issues. Some cases phenomenal, some not. I think a lot of people have that. And the thing is, their, their vision might just be different than mine. Like we were working on creating this vision of what we want, what we want to achieve and being able to communicate it. So I just realized the best way for me to achieve this is going to be to be able to like walk five feet over, bring somebody into the appointment, show them what it looks like on try and day, not even a photograph in real life. I just realized this is going to be the gold standard for how I'm going to be able to grow and like, you know, really push the bar. Yeah. And yeah. that's, that's, that's how I did it. Yeah. Okay, so now um, tell us about when you brought this technician in house, a little bit about them, like why why you picked them and what it was like, like when he first started with you, because I'm sure it was, you know, you're he's a very talented master ceramist. You're you have a very clear vision of what you want as a clinician. So I'm sure it was not the easiest, smoothest <laughs> first you know, month or yeah. so. Yeah, so we we started looking for people, trying to find uh, different qualified technicians, looking at sample works. People were sending some of their work for evaluation. Of course, sending their best cases is always the, the reality. You know, like people will cherry pick their cases. But we looked at experience, about vision, about their uh, personality was very big, too. And then the cases. And we narrowed our selection 
down. And so who we selected was Paulo Battistella. He's an amazing guy. His personality is top, 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 great yeah. training. And most importantly, he told me something like he said, like, I like this biomimetic type of practice you're doing. He's like, I wrote a book called Keep It Simple. And it talks about the biomimetic, like doing layering of ceramic, like natural teeth. So I'm like, you know what, this is a good story. And his commitment is there to like, really trying to like, innovate. So like, that was it. And I selected him and he ended up, um, it was a visa situation. So it was a whole process. Didn't know how long that's going to take. I thought it might take a year and a half, two years, but he was so qualified. He was literally accepted and approved within four months. I didn't even have a lab ready. Like I didn't have space. I'm like, Oh my God, I have a small office. He's like, and his personality is the best thing. He's like, no problem. Whatever space you give me, we'll figure it out. I'm like, I literally have like, uh, four feet by three feet like that's what i have wow. right now. It's like you know so, he made it so what was he working in uh was he an employee in a lab before he came to work with you or where was he coming from For, he came from brazil he owned his own lab okay but wanted to come to the u.s and uh, his children were younger and it's only been three years now two and a half years but he wanted to like you know resume his life here and start a new life here and um, he also said being a practice owner was very stressful and he wanted to be able to work with a doctor like myself who shares his vision so that we can okay. really, really grow. So he well, came. it is hard for lab owners. I mean, when you think about sharing a vision and finding that that fit with one client, but yeah. you have however many other clients who are going to each one of them be different. I've always looked at that challenge that a lab owner faces or a technician faces and wondered how they do it yep. because everybody wants something different, you know? Yeah. So I can he imagine, yeah, I can imagine that for the technician as well, for Paolo as well to have understanding, a complete understanding of the vision and never have to switch gears yeah. would have to be a really nice uh, change a welcome change yes and but at the same time he probably didn't expect how picky i would be in certain things but his personality the whole time he's always understood and he's he shares the same passion so like when i point something out he's very receptive to change he doesn't take like like i'm not criticizing like i will often say if my prep's the problem, let's fix it. Like, let's determine yeah. why we have this issue. Whatever it is, let's fix it. I don't care if it's my prep. I want to fix that. Okay. So that leads me to my next question because the troubleshooting on a case is, I mean, I'm part of dentist like Facebook groups and I'm part yeah. of technician Facebook groups. And it's the same story, just the flip side <laughs> a yeah. lot on those groups. Yeah, yeah. It's always like, oh, this, you know, technician says it's my fault. Oh, the dentist says it's my fault. You know, it's really seems to be a hot button about like when things go wrong, how do you work together as a team? So it's got to be a little bit easier, maybe in some ways to have that in-house technician to where you guys are in the same room. Communication's easier, right? It's mm -hmm. not a text that's misinterpreted or whatever. You're having a conversation. You're there looking at the patient. So how do you troubleshoot um, a case? And how how difficult is it to have that conversation with somebody? At least if the conversation doesn't go well with the technician on the phone, you guys can both hang up and walk away. But yeah. you're under the same roof with your technician now. How do you troubleshoot? <laughs> Yeah. So it's, first of all, when, when you're in the same building, same little practice, you have no, no fingers to point. You can't say his fault, my fault, it's our fault. We need to fix it together. I take responsibility for all this stuff. And so we try to figure out what the problem is in the past. What I used to do is depending on what the problem is, take photographs, make PDF files or PowerPoints that draw little arrows requesting change. Like I'm always very specific about what I want. The, I think the biggest thing I learned in dental school, I remember this is that like, if you can't identify the problem, you can't fix it. You have to be able to see the problem. It's not just patient didn't like it, it or patient wants wider. Well, you, you have a space. You only have X amount of space. What can you do to make it wider? Can you envision that the line angle is going to help? Or is this just the patient's expectation that is, you know, needing adjustment, but I've gotten good at identifying the problem. And then we work on improving our process every day, every week, our process has been improving everything from shade to uh, trueness to our design from start to finish is a work in progress. So we identify where it went wrong, we figure it out. And 
we don't really take a failure in meeting our expectations personally. We take it as like a challenge to rise for the next time to minimize. Of course, we dream of not having to ever redo a case and delivering on the first time every time, but we just focus on the constant improvement and both of us being receptive to it and both of us suffering when it doesn't go as planned. He has to remake which means my other cases fall behind sometimes, which means that my time in the chair is also essentially, let's say, wasted, but we're mm -hmm. in it together. And we have, you know, we both see both sides of everything. So we try to be respectful, find the problem and fix the process and try to implement something so that in the future, this that, gets that, smaller that and doesn't smaller happen and again. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. So there's another thing that really surprised me when I heard you speak before, speaking of patient expectations that you mentioned. Yeah. Um, there's the, you, you're in Beverly Hills. So the Hollywood white, you know, is what we call the crazy yeah. PMA disc that like blinds yeah. you when you open the box. Mm -hmm. So you live in Hollywood white land. Um, you have a way of presenting patients. You, you said, you know, with biomedics being as important as they are to you, that natural harmonious look that you're replacing what is missing, not uh, renovating what is missing. You talked about how if you present a patient with two options, one, a natural look and two, cosmetic, I, I want to say you said like 90% of the time, maybe that's too much, but a majority of the time they will select the natural look. So exactly what it is, is like people always say patients in this area don't want, I remember we talked about this back then, people always say in this area, they don't want a natural look. What it is, I don't necessarily show them, here's two wax ups for you, but I start with a natural and then I listen to what they say. And if they say, oh, I want this embrasure close, I try to educate a little bit and say, look, that's not natural, but I'll do whatever they want if that's their, if they have a strong preference for it. But it's too simplistic to think that because people live here, that's what they want. In fact, most of the time they come in and when I educate them, they pick 90% of the time, they pick a more natural. But every now and then, 10% of the time, I do end up back like, I, I really want to close this embrasure. I want them the more similar length. So at least I try. It's my job to educate and teach and show. But if I don't show them that, mm -hmm. every one of them will probably take what I give and not know better because they trust me to be like guiding them. And so it's it's about education and at least giving an effort to, you know, achieving that look unless you are only focusing on that and that's what you want. But my vision is to do beautiful but natural looking smiles, not to do like, you know, white and artificial. I really want, and that, there's some people that want that, but I just don't want to do that as my like bread and butter work. Yeah. So when you present a, a patient with um, those options, how are you presenting those? Do you have like a, a virtual tool where you're showing them what they could look like with the natural look or other looks? How do you present them with those options? Yeah, that's a great question. So I first I start with a uh, 2D desi design and I'm using things like the uh, smile design apps. One of them is called SmileFi, another one, which is amazing, amazing. Then there's a lab that I have used also for more complex cases called the DSD Planning Center. But basically, I design in 2D and show them a before and after. Um, sometimes I actually skip that step and go straight to the 3D design so I can do the mock-up and show them like in their mouth because that's the most relevant. But a picture is very powerful. A lot of people are using it for selling. I try not to use it for selling. I try to use it for communication and asking them questions and seeing what they think. But the the most powerful way I communicate and show it to them is the mock-up, the 3D, finally the 3D design that I make. And I can make that myself now. Uh, we used to do wax ups. We used to copy the 2D design into our like our uh, perception of what it would look like in 3D because you know when it's 2D and you're going 3D, you can take some measurements, but there's a lot of room for interpretation. But when you make it in 3D, you are able to print. Sorry, when you design it in 3D, you're able to print that. So I do that. We do the mock up, and then we go from there. Longer, shorter, square. I don't like this embrasure. That's how we do. Okay, so you're you're designing in 3D, you're printing a model, you're doing yep. a putty matrix, and then doing you use new outline, the new outline PMMA. Pour that in yep. there, you set that up in the mouth and let them wear it. Do they go home with that? I try to. 90% of the time I encourage it because a lot of times people will tell you, 
uh, first, their first impression isn't consistent with their impression or their uh, final expectation. So what happens is they oftentimes will say it's too long if we've added, if you added like any length, especially even if they've Because it feels their, different. It feels different. And the first reaction is a little shocking, but, but 70 or so percent of the time by my estimates, they come back and say, actually, now that I've had it for a few days, I like it. You know, it's just, it's too much of a shock. So I try to one show them a picture instead of the mirror, if I can, so they can see it like with one degree of separation. Then That's I tell them to go home with it, you know, like to go, yeah, because up close here, it's a lot different than to seeing your whole face and being able, you know, the before after perception. Because when they look like this, they look at just the teeth. When they look at the photo of their face, they're looking at like the whole they thing. They see their eyes. Zoom. They see all their facial features, everything. everything. That makes a lot of sense. That makes yeah, a lot so of I sense. Do that. And then I try to send them home and I tell them it won't, it's not bonded. It's not glued. It's just kind of like shrink wrapped on there. And I tell them it can last up to a week if they're careful. But basically if it doesn't stay on, that's fine. You can get it off with your, you know, your fingernails basically and floss. And most of the time they can. I've only had one patient not able to get it off and that had to do with like black triangles. So they go home, they get to form an opinion and they give me feedback and then we go from there. We will do another design as needed. The idea is to kind of give them an opportunity to evaluate what you're proposing, not to press your opinion on them and force them into something. And that's what happens when you do like a Hollywood smile and you don't show them other options of course it's you know it's very rare that a patient comes and knows more about dental anatomy than we do so yeah. if you don't show them that it's very unlikely they start saying move the line angle make it rounder open the embrasures they're they're probably just not going to know exactly what to do yeah do you ever have patients that come back and say i still don't like it but all my friends and my husband like loved it so okay yeah i guess you're right <laughs> <laughs> let's see it's not not a hundred percent but somewhat okay I have a case that I got permission to use for Instagram face and everything. You know, uh, we worked out a deal and I said that, like, I'll give you uh, a little bit of a break on a couple of things if I can use that. So she ended up uh, thinking they're a little bit long, even though everybody loved it. So I did a poll <laughs> on Instagram before or after. And it was like 98%. And she's like, when I see my face, she's like, when I saw that with my face, she's like, I realized, you know, like, <laughs> you're right. You're totally right. You know, because she went home and she's like, I, I liked it a lot, but I still think I would like, you know, a little, a, a lot shorter, actually. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, you know, we'll do, but yeah, I'm like, I'm, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to do this poll to share with her. And she ended up seeing it and she's like, I saw the poll. I agree now. Let's go. So oh, that's funny. Sometimes it's it's not someone she knows per se, but it was like the population of patients. <laughs> like literally it was 87% said that the, the after because she wanted to maybe stay closer to her original length. So I used the before versus the after uh, of a mock-up. And 87% said the after when looking at just the lips. And then it was 96% or something like that when you like show the, the whole, whole face. face. Yeah, even more. Like it went up after that. And I think we got like 300 votes or so. So yeah, it yeah, it was pretty a definitive. good thing, guys. Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, speaking of feedback in general, um, one thing that I think just because of your personality type, I imagine that you've always been pretty good. You push for what you want. But when you're when you're successful with that lab technician partner that you're partnered with on this case, when you're successful, I feel like you're probably the kind of person that shares that success story and make sure that that technician benefits from that story, too. So before you had I'll take you back in time. And I know you told me, like, now that I have an in-house technician, like, this is how I work now. Like, all your procedures revolve around that setup. Mm -hmm. But back in time, when you didn't have that scenario where Paolo couldn't come over and talk to the patient and see the outcome, how important was it that you find in your relationship with your technicians that you shared that feedback? As a rhetorical question, like, I know it's valuable. Yeah. But how did you share it? And what kind of impact did that have? How important is it for dentists to do that? It's literally it's mandatory you can't grow on words like you know the picture is worth a thousand words it couldn't be more true in this case you have to be able to show a picture both the good and the bad that's the only way to learn you know like sometimes there would be a groove of staining trying to match another groove and we missed and it's like you know we got to make some landmarks like the groove's going this way and the other stain is here so it's like just misses the direction yeah. other times 
just beautiful shade, beautiful anatomy, seamless margins, you have to share it so that they can like keep calibrating. So it's very important. And that's the only way, like I, I really subscribe to this philosophy of it's never good enough. It doesn't mean I'm not happy with my work. I'm very proud of the work I do, but I'm always trying to make it better. I, I don't want to get, I used to want to get to a place where I'm just done and that's it. But now I just want to see how do I continue to improve and make things better, like down to occlusion, adjustments, contacts, you know, all those little details. So it's mandatory. If you don't share photographs of the case, it's, you can only get so much improvement, you know, it, it mm -hmm. should be understood that, that that's going to be a big handicap versus the full potential of giving feedback on every single case. But the reason people don't do it is very simple. It takes time. People yeah. aren't willing to put the time in, but if you want something, you got to put the time in. That's right. Well, and I mean, I, I, I'll get pictures, texted pictures on my phone all the time of a case that a technician's so proud of and it's beautiful and it's yeah. natural. And I'm sure like yeah. it is just going to look beautiful in the mouth. I'll say, Oh, do you think the dentist can send you a picture of this case in the mouth? No. I'm not kidding. Like over 75% of the time it's I'll try, I'll try, but mm -hmm. I really doubt they'll send me one. And that's always something that I just kind of can't imagine uh, withholding that kind of satisfaction, I guess I'd say I for the technician. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like that's something that really did benefit you when you were working with technicians is something that you think is mandatory. So I mandatory. Yeah. totally agree. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate your time. I'm glad to see, you know, sometimes I think it's easy for technicians who are out there trying to create excellence um, there's not a huge audience for it. <laughs> there's yeah. really not. I so I wish that, um, I wish there were more tech, more clinicians that had the striving for excellence that I see you have, even from dental school, you're pushing yourself from day one. I'm so oh. happy that you and Paolo found each other <laughs> and have gotten through, you know, a lot of improvement together as a team. It sounds like the level of dentistry you're practicing now is probably higher than you anticipated, I would think, coming out of dental school. Yeah, I didn't know what to expect, but it's, it's you know, it's always improving. So it's always going to be higher. I, I can't even set like an expectation anymore. I can just basically enjoy the process. And I did want to say though, for any technician thinking there isn't like-minded, I have a training institute and I train people and I, the number one question is who, who do you recommend for lab? Who do you recommend for that? They're out there. I promise you there's like dentists wanting to do this that are hungry. It's just like being able to connect and being able to interface. It takes time. You know, it's like, I've heard things like you're so lucky to have found Paul or you're lucky to have found this office, but it's just, if you put yourself in the position of doing quality work and there's dentists that also do the same, put themselves in there and they really strive to connect, they'll find it. You know, it, it takes time and effort, but you will, I know, like are they always asking me and I'm a little disconnected from that side of things right now. So I give a few suggestions, but they're out there and it's like very important. And I think the future generation of dentists with Instagram, I think it's in more demand than it's been in the past. I really, that's yeah, what it that's a like great point because now where, you know, dentists are, I mean, Instagram is huge for dentists and yeah. the kind of work you see on Instagram is a high, high level. So it's in their yeah. face, literally every day in their face. Yeah. The they were retraining what dentists yeah. think they should see. So that that's kind exactly. of a cool social media. Really cool. Say what you will about it, but that's a pretty cool uh, byproduct of it, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, I know that in the comments section, um, I will put a link when we uh, kill the live broadcast. I'll get on there and I'll put a link to more info about Nijad Institute. Uh, do you have technicians that come for courses or is it just for dentists? Can technicians come? Uh, te technicians can come. There was one that came uh, a couple of years back, but it's now an online course anybody can take, but, okay. um, but it is designed for dentists. But I am also considering with Paulo implementing courses that are 
on the lab side for dentists, but they could be very relevant for a technician. Like it's meant to show what I believe. Like I think the average dentist needs to have a little more hands-on involvement in the lab side of things because I touch a lot of the restorations we do and it's so valuable to learn the process and see. And it also helps my hands get better and it helps Paulo see what I want because I can demonstrate certain things. So yeah. we want to do a course like that. And that would be such a good course to like, bridge the two together you know what i mean seeing dentists that want to start because we're not trying to replace a technician i'm just trying to help you the dentist understand what it's like in ceramics so that you can get the result you want and communicate it better and speak the language i mean it is a different language and when yeah. you both speak it it certainly helps totally well i appreciate it so much we're at the beginning of a three-day weekend are you working monday oh, yeah. nope i'm off i'm excited <laughs> Me Very too. Excited. I'm ready. Yeah. I'm yeah, ready. Well, All right. Well, thank you so much. And we'll talk again soon. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.